when you hear voices talk about the progress or not of reconciliation, what do you think needs to be added to that conversation? What point do you want people in this country to really digest today? Well, the interesting thing I always find when it comes to talking about reconciliation is that we're, we're talking primarily to Indigenous people and primarily to younger Indigenous people. Uh, and, um, and and one of our failings is to take into account the, the, the need for us to engage with the non-Indigenous community about their sense of um, what they need to do, their sense of commitment. And we, we, we have to broaden the conversation out. Uh, and I know that Indigenous youth always feel like we're the ones doing all the heavy lifting and we're the ones that are doing all the work. And that's part of the frustration is because we do it. We, we, we pick up the challenge because we know it's important. But then at the end of the day, after we've made the effort, sometimes many times, uh, we look around and we don't see the results we had anticipated or we don't see any results or we may even, in fact, be overcome by the negative reaction to everything that's going on out there. And, and that's very frustrating. And it, uh, it's important to keep in mind what uh, I said at the end of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's events back in 2015. I said, getting to the truth was hard revealing to Canada all of this story was important, but it was very hard. It was hard on the survivors and their families and to the communities. But getting to reconciliation is going to be even harder because now we have to convince Canadians that they have to change. So what do you think then stands in the way of, of non-Indigenous Canadians doing that act of reconciliation? Well, part of it is they don't fully understand their role in it. It's much like, you know, I always tell people when it comes to reconciliation, we should really think about this in terms of a, a um, domestic abuse situation where the husband finally is caught after all these years of abusing, oppressing uh, his partner, denying rights, taking away the kids, uh, convincing her that everything that's wrong is her fault that there's something wrong with her, there's nothing wrong with him, that she's um, a lesser human being and he's a perfect human being. And then suddenly we catch him in all of those lies and he says, oh, okay, sorry. Now let's get over this and let's move on. Reconciliation is not that easy, but from his perspective, it is that easy. But from the perspective of the victim of all of this, uh, uh, it's about what are you doing to change the way you do things? What are you doing about your attitude? What are you doing about your behavior? How do I know that you're not going to keep doing this? Because I see you keep doing this. I see that you haven't given up an ounce of your power. You haven't given up any um, of the laws and any of the, the changes, any of the authorities that you field you have, you still control all the bank accounts, you still control all the money, you control everything in that relationship and you haven't changed a bit and your thinking is just as bad as it used to be. And that's the kind of situation that uh, we see out there. And what we need to do to convince Canadians to recognize that is we need to somehow get them to see that this could easily have been them or this could easily be them. Uh, when I was doing a, a presentations, public presentations, I said, just imagine if Donald Trump managed to take over Canada. What would he do to this country? He would make it into his own image. He would make it into the image of a country that he would want. He'd treat it like one of his, his uh, hotels and golf courses. He would make himself literally the king. And then all Canadians' rights would be denied. We would not be given the same rights as Americans. We would be given less rights, and we would be convinced that there's something wrong with us. And so this could happen to you someday. And how are you going to be able to deal with that if you haven't figured out how to deal with this? The hollowness of the sorry that I hear you talking about makes me wonder how you feel about this day. So we're at the 25th anniversary of the National Indigenous Peoples Day. And I, I wonder, 
how it sits with you, especially in the wake of, of these terrible discoveries in places like Kamloops and Brandon, Manitoba? When I said that getting to reconciliation is going to be harder, I also said that it took us seven generations of constant oppression to get to this point. It's going to take us seven generations at least of concerted effort, of constant daily effort to correct the situation and make it into the kind of relationship that it needs to be. And that relationship needs to recognize that Indigenous people were here first. They had rights that have been ignored and taken away. And their situation has been denigrated by the governments of this country historically and by the institutions of this society. And we need to address that. This particular day is important for us as Indigenous people because it gives us uh, an opportunity to gather together uh, when the pandemic lifts, of course, because in this COVID age, uh, gathering together is very difficult. But it gives us an opportunity to gather together to remind ourselves of what we have, to remind ourselves that we are valid, that, to remind ourselves that we are people who have a history, that we have traditions, we have a culture, we have language, we have the right to celebrate who we are. And we want to share it with those who are willing to share it with us on those equal terms. And on this day then, when you see that the House passes a motion to, you know, to finally fund the identification of, of the sites of the residential schools to, to investigate the potential presence of, of other remains of children, that, that, you know, this money that was identified in 2019 and, and not yet distributed, that motion means what to you on this day? Well, it's a small gesture. It's totally inadequate in terms of the amount of money that's going to be needed. Um, but at the same time, it's hard to measure uh, the cost of what it is that we're trying to fix here. Uh, we have uh, hundreds and thousands of young Indigenous children who died in these schools, some of them brutally, some of them at the hands of priests and nuns and, and uh, people who worked in the schools. Uh, and uh, we need to understand that the parents, the families of those children were unaware of what happened totally. Uh, but, and they're not even sure that any of these children are connected to them. So there's a lot of work that's mm -hmm. going to need to be done. Uh, we had a, a set of calls to action in our report in which we talked about this being uh, a very serious question that still bears investigation. We denied the right to investigate that in the TRC. We think it still merits investigation. And until it's resolved, it's not going to uh, be possible for us to achieve that this relationship that we want to have with each other. Um, but the important thing is, it's uh, beginning to be seen that there is still an ongoing obligation on the part of government to, to provide the resources necessary. But it's, this is not simply about uh, finding the bodies and then moving them or then putting a marker on there. It's also about discovering when they died, what they died of, who was responsible for that, and doing all that is necessary to treat this as a potential crime scene. And then to give them the proper ceremonial burial that everybody's entitled to. When these discoveries were talked about a, a few weeks ago, I, I know that you got a lot of calls from survivors and, and people who have been missing family members and that you were in this position of, of doing a lot of listening of, of the stories from them. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if some of what you heard really stands out for you a little bit right now. Is there anything you can share with us about those conversations? Well, you know, the conversations were very similar to what we had heard during the TRC, but with more poignancy. I had one, um, uh, one lady who called me uh, and her, her mother was uh, 109 years old. 
uh, from the Survivor Residential Schools. And she called me um, just to tell me that her mother can't stop crying and they don't know what to do for her. And she wanted to know if I would at least talk to her and maybe my voice would help. And I did. And it seemed to help a little bit. But uh, when I check back, they say that she's she's just lost. Uh, it's almost like she's lost the will to live. And 109 years old, she was energetic. She used to go for walks every day. And now they say she she won't even step outside the house to sit in the sun. Um, and so it's about how, how the survivors are triggered again. And the triggering of the survivors is the one thing that this all concerned me the most, uh, that we were putting them through the, the pain of the trauma that they had experienced again. But this time, we don't have any healing programs for them. We, this time, we don't have any places where they can gain the help that they need. We don't have the people who are being um, available, made available in the communities to help them. And we at least had some of that during the TRC, but we don't have that anymore because the government funded those healing programs until the TRC was about to end, and then they stopped funding them. And they should return uh, to funding those programs because we need them to understand that this trauma never goes away. And instead, I suppose, of, of those programs, people reach out to someone like you um, and you're in a position to listen because you are a leader for so many people. And, and as we have this conversation, maybe this is a bit of an odd question, but as we sit here, there is a vacancy in the office of the Governor General. Is this an opportunity? H have you been approached about that post? W would it be a post that you would ever consider taking? Well, there have been many who asked me if I would uh, allow them to nominate me, and many who suggested that I should do that kind of work. Um, but, you know, when you're in a position like that, your uh, availability to speak out, your um, ability to, to take action, your ability to confront what government is doing or not doing is very limited. And that's not a role that uh, attracts me at all. I think that my um, uh, community actions is far more important than any symbolic position that I could occupy. And so I've declined every effort to offer that position to me. And uh, as Lyndon Johnson once said, if asked, I will not serve. So. Do you think that position could ever be changed meaningfully in this country? I think it's an important position. I think it has meaning right now. I don't think it has meaning for Indigenous survivors yet. Um, not, not in the same way that it does for the rest of Canada. I think that we do need to uh, look for someone who is able to find a good balance between speaking for the, the Crown in, in this country and the government, uh, and at the same time, uh, recognizing the importance of ensuring that the voices of the citizens uh, who have been victims of this history are heard and are um, given their proper place in society. And, Your Honor, I suppose from here on June 22nd, where, where do we go? We keep on keeping on, so to speak. Uh, we keep on trying to show that um, what little the government has done is not enough, that there are still some major calls to action that have not yet been addressed. We need to ensure that the, those calls to action which they have addressed are properly implemented. Uh, language, uh, the language bill that said that Indigenous people have the right to have their languages uh, uh, revived for them uh, is properly supported through these uh, the financial resources of the government because the government spent enormous amounts of financial resources to take their languages away 
the laws that were passed and enacted, uh, some of which are still on the books, need to be reviewed and need to be uh, removed. And a, a new legal relationship needs to be established that is fully cognizant of the rights of indigenous people. Um, because what I said is, um, at, at the time and shortly after the TRC, is that reconciliation will not occur so long as one side sees it as a question of rights and the other side sees it as an act of benevolence. And right now, we have to get the government to see that this is not about their benevolence. Your Honor, thank you for your time, as always. Adrienne, it's always good to talk with you. Thank you. Take care.